All right, let's get started. Today, we're going to talk about the history of the People's Republic of China uh, from 1949 to 1966. So last time we talked about China's, China's experience in World War II and how the civil war broke out immediately after World War II between the Communist Party and the Nationalist Party. Uh, the civil war was between 1946 to 1949 ending in the defeat of the Nationalist Party. Jiang kai the leader of the Nationalist Party uh, and his followers had to uh, flee uh, to Taiwan uh, and, uh, and they, they maintained their rule there uh, until, until the, uh, the Nationalist Party maintained their rule there all the way until the 1990s. So we're gonna talk about uh, the history of what's known as China during after after 1949. So first, let's talk about Taiwan a little bit because uh, Taiwan really is a, a very important a very important um, issue that is sort of affecting uh, the the uh, the international order and the security and the peace uh, in the in the Pacific Ring uh, in in the Asia Pacific area, right? Taiwan. So you really have to understand uh, the issue of Taiwan to understand the. The, uh, the tension between the United States and China uh, today. So we're gonna uh, briefly talk about the so-called Taiwan issue. Okay, so if you look at the history of Taiwan, uh, for thousands of years, it's just a, an island uh, in, the, in the West Pacific uh, where the Chinese empire did not have much interest to rule for most of the time in Chinese history. Uh, there, there, are, there are native people uh, living there. Uh, the native Taiwanese, they, they're not Chinese. They, speak, they don't speak Chinese. They speak a Polynesian language. Uh, actually, uh, recent anthropological study have found out that most of the Polynesian peoples, including people in Hawaii, uh, people in the Easter Island, and the many, many other people in the, many other native peoples in the South Pacific, they should probably share the same ancestor in Taiwan. So, so thousands and thousands of years ago, the original ancestors of all Polynesian language speaking peoples, they set out from Taiwan to explore the ocean. So, so this is why the native people in Taiwan, they speak, today they still speak a sort of Polynesian language. Okay, so how Chinese migrated to Taiwan? Chinese migrated to Taiwan quite late actually. Uh, during the probably the Lei Ming and the Qing a dynasty during the uh, during the Qing dynasty. Uh, for the 200 years of the Qing, uh, there are many Chinese uh, they uh, migrated to Taiwan from Fujian province, right? If you look at the map, right? Uh, this is the map. Fujian province is here. So over the past like 200 years, many Han Chinese speaking Fujian uh, or Fuzhou dialect, they migrated to Taiwan. Okay, so the so migration, the Chinese migration to Taiwan is quite late actually. Uh, and, uh, and the Qing government, the Qing Empire, set up a set up a local administration in Taiwan, right? Uh, for example, I uh, one of my ancestors, actually my my grand my grandfather's great grandfather, served as the county magistrate in Taiwan. Uh, yeah, and his name is Wei Ying. Yeah, he he served as the county magistrate of Fengshan County. Uh, uh, See in today's Kaohsiung city in, in Taiwan. So yeah, um, so the Qing government had their own administration in Taiwan until, until the first Sino-Japanese war, right? We talked about this. Uh, the Sino-Japanese war was between 18, uh, 1894 to 1895. Uh, as a result of the defeat of the Qing Empire, Qing Empire was defeated by, by, by Japan, by the Japanese Empire. Uh, as a result, the uh, the Qing Empire had to give Taiwan to to Japan. Uh, so, so J so Taiwan became Japan's uh, overseas colony. Okay, and this situation remained in Taiwan until the end of World War II in 1945. So, so the colonial experience of Taiwan under Japanese rule was from 1895 to uh, 1945. Okay, so during this time period. Although the majority of the population in Taiwan, they were they were they were they were they were Chinese descendants, but they received a colonial education and a colonial rule uh, by Japan. 
right? This situation is sort of similar to Okinawa, right? We know that Okinawa became, uh, became a Japan's colony in the 1870s, about 20 years before Taiwan. Uh, Taiwan, uh, so, so Japan sort of maintained the same colonial rule in, in both Noki, Okinawa and Taiwan. So that means uh, Japanese language is, is a dominant language. All education is choose uh, to, to, to inculcate this uh, Japanese national identity among uh, the local people, right? So Taiwanese during these uh, 50 years of colonial rule, uh, they, they, they had to uh, speak uh, Japanese in, at a school, at all uh, official formal occasions, but they may speak their, uh, the, the, the Taiwanese, the Fujianese dialect at, at home. So it's sort of a the situation is kind of, kind of complicated. So when World War II broke out, Taiwan certainly provided Japan with their own resources and manpower. For example, many Taiwanese served in the Japanese Imperial Army uh, invading China, because many Taiwanese, they, they, they can speak Chinese, right? So, so they worked as interpreters uh, for, for the Japanese Imperial Army uh, during World War II. Uh, so, uh, and, uh, and as a result, Taiwan was also bombed by the allies, uh, just like Japan's homeland. So right before Japan surrendered, you know, there, there's, a, there's a sense of a desperation in Taiwan because uh, people are talking about, we're gonna lose the war, right? So they are, because Taiwanese identity is that they, they belong to Japan, they're part of Japan. But then in August, 1945, uh, when Japan declared uh, surrender, the Chinese came over to Taiwan saying, no, you didn't lose the war, we won the war. So, so think about the situation in Taiwan. So yesterday, Taiwanese say we're losing the war, but, <laughs> Today they're saying we're winning. <laughs> Chinese were winning because for mainland Chinese, Taiwan is part of China. So, so the people from mainland China they consider the Taiwan as their compatriots, right? So, so the message is that you we win the war. So, so a lot of times in history, identity is quite uh, complicated. Identity it means um, you know what country you think you belong to or what kind of a, a, a political force or 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 human groups you, you, you think it belong to. This is a quite complicated uh, uh, area, right? So is Taiwanese Japanese or, or, or Taiwanese or Chinese? It's difficult to say, it's very difficult to say. But what happened after 1949, I'm sorry, uh, what happened after World War II in 1945 is that Jiang kai government sent officials to rule Taiwan. But before 1949, Jiang kai did not pay much attention to the island because it's just a remote island, right? Um, with only millions of people living there. So Jiang kai the, the officials uh, sent from, from mainland China, they're pretty corrupt, pretty corrupt. So some Taiwanese, they welcomed uh, the, the arrival of mainland Chinese officials at first, right? So some, some Taiwanese still maintain the Chinese identity. So they welcomed this, uh, this return of Taiwan to, to China. But very quickly, they found out that Jiang kai government is very corrupt. Okay, very capitalist. So they got very disappointed. And then in 1949, uh, when Jiang Kai-shek lost the civil war in mainland China, so if we look at the map, in 1949, Jiang Kai-shek lost the civil war. Uh, uh, Jiang Kai-shek and, uh, uh, and the army loyal to him had to all move, migrate to Taiwan, the, this island. So all of a sudden, the tension or the conflict between mainlanders and the local Taiwanese became, uh, it, it was escalated, it was escalated. Uh, the, the, the people, the Chinese from, from mainland, uh, they're, all new, they're all newcomers, but they, main, they, they controlled the government. They, they monopolized all the governments, all the important businesses, and, and they pushed the local Taiwanese out of the government. So the local Taiwanese thought they were sort of discriminated against, right? Uh, so in 1949, there was a, a riot called a, a February 28th, February 28th uh, uh, incident. So basically, the, the, in this incident, um, the Jiang kai nationalist party government, uh, they sort of bullied the local people on the market, and then it sort of in, uh, caused a riot of local Taiwanese against the government. And it became a sort of a, a genocide on both sides. Uh, local Taiwanese, they're killing the mainlanders. If they, if they found someone who don't speak 
Taiwanese, they would kill him, beat him up. And then, of course, uh, Jiang Kai-shi also sent an army to those uh, cities uh, where riots broke out to kill the local, local people. Uh, so this is a genocide on both sides, but this is sort of a, became a scar in the local memory of Taiwanese. Uh, and uh, Jiang Kai-shi basically used Taiwan. Uh, this, is, <laughs> this is a picture taken when Jiang Kai-shi was in Taiwan. He made a speech to criticize himself. He says, we made it, we nationalist party made this huge mistake. We lost Taiwan. We lost millions of troops in Taiwan. We lost the civil war. And I am the one to blame. And he, he was so emotional that he burst into cry, burst into tears uh, in a speech. Uh, Jiang Kai-shi, between 1949 to 1975, when he died, he never forget about the, uh, his, uh, uh, his, uh, his ambition to recover mainland China. He's he basically used Taiwan as sort of a military base to prepare uh, for a, a counterattack to mainland China to take it back. He always wanted to take back something he lost, but of course, this never happened. It's never happened. Okay, yeah, on the on on the on the on the coast uh, of uh, of the the territories controlled by the Nationalist Party facing mainland China, you will see this. You will see this sign: "三民主义统一中国." Uh, it means unify China with the Sun Yat-sen's uh, principles of uh, uh, three principles of people. Remember, we talked about that, right? Uh, the Sun Yat-sen's three principles of people. Yeah, democracy, nationalism, and the livelihood, right? Uh, but on the other hand, uh, okay, this is a propaganda poster on the mainland China part, okay? The, the Communist Party that controlled uh, mainland China also wanted to unify Taiwan. So... <laughs> So from from 1949 1949 to 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 the um, uh, to the 1970s, the both both governments of China wanted to uni defeat each other. They wanted to sort of a unify China, uh, but neither side uh, was successful. So the situation is that in in today in today's world, there are still two governments that claim to be China. Uh, one is the PRC, People's Republic. Of in Beijing, the other is uh, Republic of China in Taiwan. Uh, after Jiang, Jiang Kai-shek died in 1975, there is a lot of a local I, consciousness rising among Taiwanese people because when, when Jiang Kai-shek was there, he, Jiang Kai-shek certainly suppressed local people's sort of a, a, their, their self-identity. Um, and, and the governments and the powers are controlled by Jiang Kai-shek's followers. And they are all from mainland China. They're all from mainland China, okay? But after Jiang Kai-shek died, Jiang Kai-shek's son, Jiang Jingguo, became the president. But in the, 90, in the 1980s, Jiang Jingguo launched a series of reform that turned Taiwan into a democratic country, a state. So, so Taiwan became democratic uh, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the early 99, 1990s, okay? Um, and then as a result, uh, there's more freedom given to people so the new generation of Taiwanese, they had very little connection with the mainland China. And they, they lived on, in Taiwan, this independent regime and, and the sort of this isolated island uh, for decades. So they don't share any identity with, uh, with, uh, with, with the mainland China. Some, some more and more Taiwanese, they don't think they're Chinese. So their identity is changing. They're changing, right? So, Taiwan, so this is how complicated the Taiwan issue is, right? So, you know, first the Taiwanese had this Japanese colonial uh, experience, and then they, 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 they got a return, Taiwan got a return to China after World War II, right? Uh, and then when Jiang Kai-shek came, Jiang Kai-shek sort of tried to turn Taiwan into a military base. And then, and then when Jiang Kai-shek died, uh, the local Taiwanese consciousness or, or, or awareness is rising. There's more and more Taiwanese think they're, they're not connected with, the, with China. And uh, of course, no one wanted to, uh, to, to, to attack mainland China. They just want to maintain their independence and their own way of life. Uh, that's, that's what most Taiwanese uh, want, to, want to do. But on the other hand, uh, for, for mainland China, for the PRC government, they always say Taiwan is part of China and they, 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 never, they never gave up uh, the, the attempt to unify Taiwan uh, one way or another in the future, either militarily or peacefully. You know, when, Deng, when Deng Xiaoping was there, um, the, the message is that the, 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 the party, the Communist Party, prefer a peaceful unification. But now, when, when, when Xi Jinping uh, rose to power 10 years ago, 
the 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 tone uh, from Beijing is that they they probably going to use military methods. So this if this happens, this will put uh, United States in a sort of difficult situation, right? Uh, okay, a very brief history of about why Taiwan is so important in the Sino-U.S. relationship. Okay, Sino means China, uh, China-U.S. relationship. Um, before Jiang Kai-shek died, uh, actually before 1971, uh, United States did not recognize PRC in Beijing, okay, as a legitimate government. Uh, United States only recognized Jiang Kai-shek's government in Taiwan as the legitimate Chinese government. And, and, and in Taiwan, the government in Taiwan, in Taipei, is an ally uh, of the United States. This situation continued all the way to 1971, when President Nixon made a decision that in order to find a stronger and a more powerful ally against the Soviet Union, which is more important, uh, a more important enemy, uh, Nixon decided that he's going to normalize the diplomatic relationship with China. And Taiwan is going to be the sacrifice. Okay, so Nixon visited Beijing, visited Beijing, and uh, literally uh, sort of a, uh, created a de facto alliance with Beijing. This happened in the early 1970s. Um, so as a result, uh, China was recognized as the legitimate government of. I mean, PRC was recognized as a legitimate government of China in the 1970s. And, 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 the, and the PRC government was, uh, was welcomed to the United Nations, United Nations in New York. Of course, this is all supported by the United States. Um, so Taiwan's position in the, in the Security Council of the United Nations was replaced by PRC. So this happened in the 1970s. Taiwan certainly thought he was you know, it was betrayed, right? Jiang kai of course, thought he was betrayed. Uh, but this is a decision of the United States, okay? So United States and China formed an alliance in the, in the 1970s against the Soviet Union. Yeah, because both powers, they, they, they did not like the Soviet Union. We're gonna talk about how China and the Soviet Union got split up later. It's kind of a complicated uh, diplomatic history. Um, so, but United States, although uh, recognized Beijing as the legitimate government of China, United States did not totally forget about the promise they gave to Taiwan. So, so there is a Taiwan Relations Act passed in, in the Congress to promise that United States, although United States, um, United States basically is gonna maintain a so-called policy of ambiguity, of vagueness. So that means United States is gonna say to both Taiwan and Beijing saying, we recognize that there is only one China in the world, okay? But what is that one China depends on your definition, okay? But on the other hand, the United States is against any military change, any change of the status quo in Taiwan Strait by military force. So that means that when Jiang kai was there, the United States uh, did not allow Jiang kai to counterattack, to launch a counterattack on mainland. But on the other hand, the United States is gonna protect Taiwan if mainland China is gonna attack Taiwan militarily. So, so United States only wanna see the status quo. Nothing changed, okay? Nothing changed, two, two governments is fine. Uh, this, is, this is the policy of vague, it's a vague policy. And, uh, and um, this, uh, this um, uh, the United States is gonna against, uh, against any change in the political situation in Taiwan without the consent, uh, peaceful consent from from the peoples on both sides of the Taiwan Strait. Uh, but we know that over the past 10 years, uh, the, the military threat from mainland China is getting, uh, is, is escalating, okay? Uh, Xi Jinping uh, is, I mean, using the wealth accumulated through the economic reform, he is probably preparing for an, a, a military attack on Taiwan. So in that case, is the United States gonna help Taiwan or not? Uh, we will see, this remains unclear, uh, remains very unclear, but uh, according to the Taiwan Relations Act, the United States is gonna help Taiwan in one way or another, but to what degree and in what way the United States is gonna help Taiwan if, if mainland China is gonna attack uh, is it, a big question, it's a big question. Uh, 
but uh, we know that uh, this could lead to a, a con military conflict between the United States and China, which are the two most economically powerful and perhaps militarily most powerful uh, countries in the world. So if a war break up, breaks out in Taiwan, that's going to be a, a very, very important uh, event in, in history. Uh, any questions? Okay, so then let's move on to uh, to mainland China. Let's talk about mainland China. Uh, since 1949, the Communist Party started to build a new government in in entire mainland China, following the Soviet Union model, but with some modifications. With some modifications. Okay, so the similarity between PRC and the Soviet Union is that is a domination of one Communist Party. Okay, in the Soviet Union case. Uh, of course, the uh, the Soviet Union, the Soviet Communist Party is the only party that is that is ruling the whole country, right? But in China, yes, the communist country, the Chinese communist uh, Chinese Communist Party is certainly dominant. Uh, but on the other hand, they allowed some kind of several uh, so-called democratic parties to rule. But but those so-called democratic parties, they're basically rubber stamp rubber stamps in the Congress in the Congress. Yeah, they, all these uh, so-called democratic parties, they all follow strictly uh, the, the Communist Party rule, okay? So if you look at the, the party structure, okay? So let's first look at the party structure. You have a chairman, right? Chairman Mao, who is also the president of China. Uh, and he's also the chair of the Chinese, the Chinese Communist Party's military commission. So he is a three-in-one leader. I call him a three-in-one leader. So first, Mao is the chairman of the party, and underneath him, there is a Chinese Communist Party, CCP means the Chinese Communist Party, Standing Committee of the Politburo, okay? The Standing Committee of the Politburo is right under Mao. Uh, the, the, uh, there are roughly between like five to nine members, depending on the time. Um, and then underneath the Standing Committee of the Politburo, you have a Politburo. Politburo's members range from like 20 to like 30, right? They're, they're normally the party boss in each province uh, or the party bosses uh, in, in, the, in the state council, right? Very important people. They make decision, right? They make decision. And underneath the Politburo, you have the CCP Central Committee. The Central Committee uh, have, I don't know, hundreds of uh, party members. Uh, they, they, are, they, are, they are, I mean, nominally they're elected. Uh, by by the ordinary party members according to the party's constitu constitution, but actually they're selected. They're actually selected by by their boss by their boss. Okay, so for each territorial um, territorial unit like like Jiangsu Province, Hunan Province, Fujian Province, each province has a party, right? A provincial party uh, party boss is he's called the uh, the party secretary, it's party secretary of that province. And at the same time, each province will also have a governor, okay? Um, so you have so, sort of a, a dual system in each province, right? The party boss in that province is more powerful than the governor, okay? So sometimes it's the same people, it's the same person. This, the same structure can be seen at a city level and a town level, right? Each city and town will have a city mayor, but at the same time, it will th th there is also a city uh, secretary, party secretary. Well, the party secretary is always more powerful than the mayor. Okay, so don't be fooled by the dual system. It's actually a one system. It's a one single system. Yeah. All right. Uh, let me show you this. Uh, this a township. This is a, it's a, it's a county government. Okay, the county government. Is a one office building. I mean, this this picture is from years ago, so so the building looks kind of crappy. But nowadays, most of the county governments are 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 has a really magnificent buildings because China accumulated a lot of wealth uh, through the economic reform. Yeah, some some of the county's government building is even larger than the White House actually. But the reason I want to show you this picture is that I want to show you that the people's government and the party's office normally is in the same place. Some, even though they're, they're separate, uh, the, the, uh, the government 
always follows the party rule, always. So it's a party state, it's a party state, okay? So that's, uh, that's the party system. And then you also have the, uh, the civilian government state system. State council, it's just sort of like a, a, the federal government here. Uh, it, can, it, has, uh, it has all these different uh, departments or mini ministries underneath it, right? Uh, yeah, the, the Chinese state council's leader is, is a premier, right? The premier normally follows uh, the, the party boss, normally follows uh, the party boss, actually always follow the party boss. So we, we don't have any, uh, any examples when, when the premier of the state council challenges the power of the party boss. It, it never happened in, in the history of PRC. And then you have different local governments. Uh, we, we talk about this, each province has a governor, each, each city has a mayor. They're all actually selected by their party boss on the higher level. But nominally, uh, governors, and, uh, provincial governors and uh, city mayors, they are elected, nominally elected by, their, by the People's Congress uh, on their administrative level. So how does this work is that the party maintains a perfect control of the People's Congress on the national level and on the local level. So, so the, 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 the so-called representatives in the People's Congress, they're not really elected by, by, by people, uh, although they're called, ironically, they're called People's Congress. But the Chinese Congress, man, they're always selected by the party just to make sure that they will vote as a rubber stamp for the party vote for anyone that the party wants to select uh, to fill the positions, okay? Yeah. Yeah, so people's, so although there is a People's Congress in Beijing and there's a Chinese People's Political Consultative Conference, sort of like the Senate and the, uh, the, the House of uh, uh, Representatives, uh, but actually all these things are, all these are perfectly controlled by the party. So that's the state system. So we talk about the party system, we talk about the state system, and then we're gonna talk about the, the, the army system, the military system. Uh, by the way, in 1949, Mao is the leader for all these three systems. He's a three in one leader. No one can challenge him. He's a party boss, he's a chairman of the party, he's a president of Chinese state, and he's a chairman of the CCP Central Military Commission. Okay, the Chinese military system does not is not loyal to the state, okay? Well, here we know that the Pentagon must follow White House, right? Because United States, Ameri the President of the United States is the commander of, of, the, uh, United, uh, of the, um, the American military force. But this is not the case in China, okay? The Chinese military force is not loyal to the state. It's only loyal to the party, okay? So you, to a certain degree, you can say the, 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 the PRC, the People's Liberation Army, is a party army. It's a party army, okay? So who, who is, the, so in other words, whoever is the chair of the military commission actually controls China. So to a certain degree, this is sort of a, you know, some scholars argue that this is sort of a, a warlord tradition. Remember the warlords we talk about, right? In 1920s, 30s, right? Jiang Kai-shi later became a warlord himself. Even Sun Yat-sen wanted, wanted to use the method of a warlord to militarily unify China. And Mao was certainly very successful in, in unifying, uh, conquering China in 1949, right? I mean, Chinese people did not vote for, for the Communist Party to rule China, right? Mao won the civil war. Mao and his party won the civil war. And this is why they created a new government, okay? So no election, no election. Uh, so within the party, whoever controls uh, the army, uh, that means who is the chair of the military commission is the boss. So when Mao was there, Mao was always the chair of the military commission. Mao was always the chairman of the party and Mao most of the time was the president of China. But for all these three positions, the most important position for Mao is the military commission chair. Okay, this is, because Mao has a saying, uh, he is saying that uh, governance comes from the barrel of a gun. That's what Mao said. Okay, so whoever has a gun has the say, uh, has, 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 uh, has the power, okay? 
Uh, the same thing. I mean, when Xi Jinping is there, Xi Jinping is Xi Jinping is again the three-in-one leader in China. Xi Jinping is the party boss. Although he he no, no one calls. I mean, after Mao died, the party decided that they're gonna remove the chairmanship. Uh, so no one is gonna be the chair. Uh, so Xi Jinping is the so-called secretary in general, Zong Shuji. Okay, secretary in general for the party. Okay, the number one in party. And Xi Jinping is also the president of China. So he visits other country on behalf of China as, as its president. But most importantly, Xi Jinping is the chair of the CCP Central Military Commission. So that means if he doesn't like anyone, the ultimate methods he's gonna use is military power. He's gonna use military to, to remove any of his rivals. Well, he did not have to so far because I mean, the police system is under under his control, uh, the intelligence system, the national security agents system is under his control. He did not have to use the army. He, he simply need to just use the police and the uh, uh, and the uh, the intelligence agents, the secret police, to remove anyone he, he did not like. All right, all right. So if we look at China, so the, so that's that's the basic structure of CCP, and uh, and uh, it, rem it continues to today. So if you want to understand China, just remember this, this PowerPoint uh, page. This is the situation of Ch in China, very different from the United States. Okay, Here we have checks and balances. We have White House. We have Congress. We have Supreme Court. We have uh, independent uh, media, press, right? All these are the different institutions we have in, uh, in the United States. But in China, there is no checks and balance balances. There are very little checks and balances. If, in other words, no one can challenge Mao. No one can challenge Xi Jinping, okay? No checks and balance. The number one leader of China can easily turn his own will, personal will into policies. For example, since two years ago, since 2020, Xi Jinping decided that he's gonna have a zero, uh, zero COVID policy. That means they're gonna, talk, they're gonna, they're gonna eliminate <laughs> uh, COVID in China. Uh, so, Many dozens of cities have locked up. Okay, tens of billions, uh, tens of millions of people got locked up in their homes. Of course, there's a lot of complaints, right? Uh, but no one can change those policies because their number one leader decided so. Just like so, in other words, Mao and Xi, their power, in my opinion, is much greater than traditional emperor. Yeah, don't think they're emperor. Okay, you you may think they're 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 Chinese emperor. They're more than emperor. Their power is much greater than emperors. Yeah, traditional emperors never had this kind of power. Okay, I mean, think about say Qianlong Emperor. We talked about him last time. Did a Qianlong power? Did a Qianlong Emperor have the power to lock up ordinary Chinese in their home? Tens of millions of them. Traditional Chinese Empire did not have the the capability to do this, but modern state can. Modern state can. Okay, so yeah. All right. So if you look at China. Um, the areas marked by this yellow color are the so-called ethnic minorities autonomous region, but don't be fooled, they're not really autonomous, okay? They're, 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 they're just like, these autonomous regions are just like other provinces of China. They're not autonomous at all. For example, right now, there's a, there is a lockup, zero COVID lockup policy in Xinjiang. Millions of people are locked up there, okay? Local government, local Xinjiang government had, had, had no say, okay? They cannot challenge or, or disobey the order from, from Beijing. So it's all vertical, it's a, it's a pyramid. It's a hierarchy, hierarchically ruled system, okay? Uh, but, but there are lots of uh, ethnic minorities that live in China, so I wanna point that out. Uh, the pink areas are all areas, most of them are, uh, have local population that are, that are Han Chinese. Never Han Chinese, but but some of them are are actually uh, have a but some of these provinces actually have a lot of uh, ethnic minorities like uh, Qinghai, uh, Sichuan, and uh, Yunnan. Actually, there are a lot of uh, ethnic minorities in Yunnan, but for historical reasons uh, that can be traced back to 1949, uh, there are five so-called ethnic autonomous regions established, including the Mongol Mongolian uh, autonomous region. The Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. Yeah, uh, there, there, are, there are many um, Turkish language speaking ethnic minorities living in Xinjiang. Uh, and then there is a Tibet Autonomous Region. And there is a Guangxi Zhuang 
uh, autonomous region. Zhuang is is one of the southern ethnic minorities. There there are many ethnic minorities in, living in southern China. Uh, their language is similar to say Vietnamese, Thai, or 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 or, or Burmese people, or or, or yeah. So um, also many languages spoken in southern China. So China, China remains a sort of a multi-ethnic, multicultural, multinational um, republic, right? Officially, it's called a republic, but more and more people are calling it an, a modern empire, a modern empire. Okay, now look at the policies in the 1950s. The policies in the 1950s is to follow Soviet Union, is to modernize China and build a modern Chinese state following the Soviet Union model, okay? Uh, we already covered the political system. Political system is, is, is basically a copy of the Soviet Union with some modifications. For example, the Chinese allowed some so-called democratic parties to, to, to share the rule uh, as long as they follow uh, the Communist Party. Um, Mao, the first country Mao visited after the creation of PRC is the Soviet Union. Mao visited in Moscow uh, and talked to Stalin. Joseph Stalin. As a result, he got some finan more financial assistance from Soviet Union. Um, Soviet Union sent hundreds of uh, uh, advisors, uh, te technicians, professors, advisors to China to help PRC to build uh, like factories, uh, shipyards, uh, important industrial uh, projects. Uh, also, also like the bridge. Uh, crossing, uh, crossing the Yangtze River. This is the bridge uh, in Nanjing City uh, crossing the Yangtze River. It was built in the 1950s. Uh, so one part of it, uh, one half of it uh, was built by the Soviets. Uh, the other half was built by Chinese themselves uh, because in the, in the early 1960s, China and the Soviet Union got split up okay, after, after, after Stalin died. But in the 1990s, I'm sorry, in the 1950s, the basic policy is to build a communist uh, uh, country, just like sort of like um, Soviet Union and the East European communist countries like Poland, Hungary, right? Czechoslovakia, uh, Yugoslavia, uh, right? Uh, ideology is a Mao Zedong thought. Mao Zedong thought is propagated in entire China as the official ideology, okay? Confucianism is denounced, okay? It's put into trash, okay? Uh, and Mao Zedong thought uh, is openly announced as China's ruling ideology. Uh, it focuses on class struggle, right? Cla uh, focuses on the so-called uh, uh, dialectical materialism and the peasants and the importance of peasants, uh, a mass line, that means uh, uh, the party is going to mobilize the population. Uh, it's, a, it's a populist tendency or orientation of, in Maoism. And Mao later developed this new idea of permanent revolution. We're going to talk about that later. Okay. And the social policies. Social policies, the first thing they do, the, the party did, is land reform. That means they, as long as they control one city or one uh, town or one village, the army is going to help uh, to confiscate the land from, from the landholders. So no, no matter how much land you have, you, you may be a big landholder, you may, may be a small landholder, it doesn't matter. All land will be taken away from you by the state. Yeah, for example, unfortunately, my, my grandparents um, in Hunan province, they happen to be big landholders from the Republican period and, and from the Qing dynasty. They, they, historically, they have hold this big land uh, since since Qing Dynasty, since 19th century. But in 1949 and 1950, during the land reform, all their land was taken away. Okay, no compensation. Yeah, in some cases, if a lot of the local villagers hate uh, the, their landlord, uh, uh, the landlord will be executed uh, immediately. Yeah, in 1950, uh, during the land reform movement close to 1 million landlords were executed. Yeah, we, without a trial, without a proper trial. Uh, so, so it's a very bloody, very bloody movements to consolidate uh, the party's rule in China. 
And then everyone, so, so the land was taken away. And then later uh, in, in 1957, in 1957, the state, this is again, this is Mao's idea. Mao organized all Chinese population, I mean, rural population into the so-called people's commune. All the land belongs to the state. Even today, even today in China, okay? If you go to today, if you go to Beijing to buy a house, to buy an apartment, you may think you own the apartment, right? But no, you only have a partial ownership of the apartment. You only, because you only own the building, you don't own the land. The land belongs to the state. This is a, this is a windfall of the party uh, that from 1949, from the land reform, okay? In land reform, the state to take all the land. So even today, all the land officially, legally belongs to the state. You buy, if you buy an apartment in Beijing, you only buy the right to use the building for 70 years. You don't own the land. You never own the land because the land belongs to the, the state. So the state, the land is the biggest asset and wealth of the state, if you think about that. Yeah. yeah to a certain degree, actually, revolution is just a lawful way to rob other people. Okay. Um, so, so land, through land reform, all the land was taken uh, by the state. Um, and then everybody is later is organized into this uh, people's commune. So in the people's commune, you basically basically become a state employee. Okay, you work on state land. Okay, and then close to eighty, more than eighty to ninety percent of your crops, your agricultural production was taken by the state. To a certain degree, you're, you're like a slave of of the state. This is this is called a collectivization. Okay, collectivization was a Soviet Union experience. Yeah, you know, Stalin did a collectivization in Soviet Union, which led to a huge famine in Ukraine. If you know Soviet Union history, right? In Ukraine, there's a huge famine because of, a, because of collectivization. Same thing happened in China, okay? After the collectivization, after people were organized into people's commune, um, most of their products, uh, no matter it's rice or potato or whatever, most of their people's agricultural products were taken away by the state. And then the state would, either, would, would provide the uh, urban centers with the agricultural products, or sometimes they would sell it out to overseas to earn, uh, say, uh, foreign currency so that they can buy machine machinery from the West. Uh, so, so in other words, the, the communist state in China they're extracting resources from the countryside, from the rural population to support modernization, to support industrialization, or to, to support whatever state projects they wanna, they wanna do. As a result, the peasants, they're, 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 they're exploited by the state and a famine is just a matter of time. So in almost all communist countries that had a collectivization, you will see huge famine. But later we're gonna talk about uh, the Chinese famine, which is even greater than the Ukrainian famine that happened in, in under Stalin. Uh, and then furthermore, all population in China was uh, classified uh, into different classes, right? According to Marxism, you're gonna, you know, the state will look at you, how much money you have to give you a class label. For example, you may be labeled as a rich landlord. If you're labeled as a rich landlord, you will have a hard time in China. Okay, although your land was already taken away by the state uh, in 1949 and 1950, but you will still keep that label of a rich landlord on you, and you will become a sort of a debased, a, a debased uh, uh, people in China. For example, your 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 children cannot join the army. Okay, and your 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 children cannot. Uh, go to college. Uh, you 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 will be if a, a movement comes, you will be the first one that that is criticized and struggled. So you will have a lot of a. Uh, if you are labeled as a sort of a, a a rich class, you will have a lot of problem uh, in uh, in in the society. And during Cultural Revolution, people can kill you on the street uh, without being punished just because your class background. Yeah. So so it creates a more social caste system under communism, ironically, because we know that communism is supposed to create a sort of egalitarian 
all right, it, 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 it's sort of an equal equality among people, right? The brotherhoods, right? Equality, right? But no, actually, in reality, it creates more discrimination and 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 oppression uh, and a social caste system uh, in China. Yeah, uh, yeah. Okay, we don't have too much time to talk about all these details, but uh, okay, very briefly. I want to tell you that in the 1950s, Mao launched a series of movements to eliminate all potential social forces that may pose a threat to the state, right? For example, religions. Religions are suppressed. Uh, local lineages, big families, as they're suppressed, they break down into nuclear families. This is a legalist tradition from, from like 2000 years ago, right? Um, yeah. Underground societies, even mafia groups, right? All, all the leaders of mafia groups, they are all arrested and executed immediately, okay? Because there is only one mafia that is allowed to exist in China. That is the party. Get that? <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah. So land, land reform. So this, uh, this propaganda poster shows uh, the struggles of a land reform. What happened is that this landlord was pulled out from his house and he was struggled by uh, the, the tenants, the villagers, poor villagers, okay? Um, as, I, as I told you, one million landlords got killed. Actually, many, many of them got killed. Many of the, those who, who are executed during land, land reform, uh, they're not necessarily landlord. They, they're only labeled of this uh, class, uh, class uh, name that is a landlord. A picture taken by poor peasant, uh, criticizing a landlord. But you know, in, in many places in China, even so-called landlord, they're not rich, right? This landlord also has, has patches on his clothes. It's a, it's a shabby clothes, right? Yeah, this is another landlord. Uh, uh, I'm sorry, this is another land reform meeting. Mao's portrait was hanging there, showing the state power. And then the communist cadres, cadres means uh, party officials, the communist cadres, they would mobilize the poor peasants to criticize the landlord. If the landlord is criticized to a certain degree, he may be executed immediately. Uh, and then the land will be measured and taken, uh, taken by the state. Uh, mafia groups or so-called counter, uh, counter revolutionaries, anyone uh, the party did not like uh, will be put into prison or executed, or executed. For example, the previous uh, nationalist, nationalist party army officers, typically he will be he will be he will be purged or executed in the 1950s. Okay, um, yeah, and also those those collaborators with the Japanese during World War II. If under World War II you are a Japanese collab you're, you're a collaborator uh, with the Japanese, uh, you you're in big trouble. You're in big trouble. Yeah. A lot of times the trial is very simple. If enough people is charging you uh, in the village, uh, you will be, you, they will have a, a public meeting like this. And then uh, the local par party government would uh, sentence you to death or many years in prison immediately. Uh, so this is what happened in the 1950s. Uh, very bloody, brutal movements to eliminate all potential enemies of the state, okay? And then economically, the party is following a Soviet Union model to have a so-called five-year plan. So all the economic activities are done by the party, party state, okay? No market is allowed. This is communism. So that means if you're a peasant, if you grow, say, peanuts in your, in your, in your own land, and if you want to, and you have a harvest, you want to sell your peanuts on the market uh, to people who want the uh, peanuts, no, you cannot. You cannot. It's illegal. If you found, if the state found out that you're selling peanuts, you grow uh, privately in your in your land, you're in prison. You're in prison. There is a there there, there is a law uh, issued by the state to stop that, okay? Because you're practicing capitalism, so you're in prison. Uh, you could, during Cultural Revolution, you could be you could be executed immediately because of that, okay? Uh, so the state believe that it's enough for the government to tell all these factories and the farms, state farms, uh, how much they how much they gonna produce and what to produce. So everything is planned, everything is regulated. Unfortunately, this did not work out, okay? Because, I mean, as economists have proven 
again and again and again in human history. No government has the data, the intelligence, and the capabilities to really predict what and how much to produce. So the, 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 the result of this state command economy is that is a shortage of everything, shortage of everything, just like in Soviet Union. In, in, in Soviet Union, when Soviet Union was there, you know that the, the, although there are stores, stores are always empty, okay? Everything is in shortage, is a shortage, okay? So the five-year plan uh, is, uh, is, is the major economic uh, policies. And then everyone in the countryside, starting from 1957, was organized into the People's Commune. And they have no personal property, basically no personal property, okay? This, everyone is super, super poor. Uh, and every day they go out to the field to work for the state. And uh, more than 80% of their product is taken away. Yeah. If a famine strikes, millions of people will die. I will tell you this, this story. And in rural centers, uh, in urban centers, I'm sorry, in, in, in cities, in the cities, uh, people are organized into so-called work units or Dan Wei. For example, if you work for a university, the university is controlled by the party, okay? Uh, if you work for a factory, this, the factory is, belongs to the party. There's a party boss uh, running the factory. There's a party boss running the university. So for every work units, there is always a party boss controlling you and then reporting to their own party boss. Okay, so it's a hierarchy, it's a pyramid system. So everyone is in the work units. So it's, it's almost like a totalitarian society where, where everything you do, every decision you, you make, uh, every, you know, you know what? My, my, I, I, my ear is ringing. There's a song ringing in my ears. It's the stings of the police band. Every breath you take, every move you make, <laughs> Yeah, someone is watching you. I'll be watching you. Remember the song? So that's typically, typically 1984, uh, you know, George Orwell sense, okay? So although, you know, uh, George Orwell wrote the, no authored the novel uh, 1984, uh, be before this time period we're talking about, but what happened in China is exactly like that. Exactly like that, okay? It's a totalitarian society. And also every household must register with the state, okay? And the free movement of people is not allowed. For example, if you live in the countryside, you, you say, hey, this is too poor. We are having a famine. I want to leave my, 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 my village because there's nothing to eat. I want to go to a big city to find a job. No, you cannot. You cannot. Or if you live in one city, say in Shanghai city, you want to move to Beijing because you, you think there might be a better job opportunity there? No, you cannot move there. Everyone is fixed in, in, in the household, uh, registered in the city. This is directly linked with the ration you will receive. Everyone receives a ration, okay? A certain, for example, if you are, uh, depending on your class background, you may be supplied with, I don't know, 32 uh, kilograms of rice. Uh, every month, okay. That that's how much you will receive, okay. As as a, as a worker in the in the work units. If you move to another city, then you lose your household registration. You lose your hukou. This is a called a hukou, and then you will not receive that ration. You will starve to death. When you move to another city, uh, it's impossible for you to find a job, and no one is going to accommodate you okay? because even if you have relatives in in the other city. Their, their, your relatives will receive their own uh, re, uh, ration uh, based on their, their, their own household registration. They, they, they wouldn't have a surplus of food for you. So there's no way to, uh, to, to, for, for, for free migration for, of anyone. Everyone is fixed in the same place and doing what the state want them to do. It's that kind of society, okay? You cannot freely choose city or, or a job to do. Uh, no market. No free uh, migration, yeah. So that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, that's uh, Maoist socialism. Uh, military. Military is highly emphasized because it's a uh, it's a military. It's you know the the new republic highlights the importance of military. Uh, the if you serve in the army, uh, at least you are free from you'll be free from the famine because uh, uh, enough food is always prioritized 
uh, you know, military units are always prioritized, even if there is a famine. This is sort of like North Korea, you know? <laughs> in North Korea, the situation is similar, okay? Uh, even though ordinary people are starving to death, but the state would not let their, their military servicemen to starve that much, right? Because they need a people, they need a military to support the regime. The, the foundation, the true foundation of the regime is actually military. So all right, so yeah, I'll show you some uh, propaganda posters of the Soviet Union supported uh factory projects. Uh yeah, and then people are encouraged to sacrifice themselves to work for the state objects, uh, projects, right? Yeah, females are mobilized to, to, serve, uh, to serve the state, just like a man, okay? So if you look at the communist uh, Chinese communist ideology, very interesting. They say, we have a liberal policy towards gender equality. That means females are gonna be freed from their household and they're gonna be respected uh, just like a man, right? Uh, you know, I remember last year, Joe Biden was giving a speech and he, he quoted Mao saying, women take up half of the sky. Yeah, do a Google search. Women take up half of the sky. This, is, this quote is from Mao, from, the, from, 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 from Mao's era. But when Mao said this, quote, this, this, this sentence, what he really means is that women are state slaves, just like a man. They're gonna be pulled out. Uh, from their household and work in the field, work in the land. Okay, so same same thing. Uh, so now, so in other words, population or, or 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 citizens are basically resources of the state of the state. Okay, um, the worship of Mao's personality. There's a cult of Mao's personality. Mao is is respected as the living god. He's always right. Right, it's, no one can challenge him. No checks and balances. Okay, and there's a Mao's statue established in every city in China, every city. Okay, of course, in the 1980s, after Mao died, uh, when when China uh, entered a new era, uh, the Deng's era or or the economic reform era, many of the sta Mao statues got to pop down. But uh, there there's still many cities in China today that has a Mao's statue. Uh, this is same similar to you know. When, when Lenin or Stalin was there, you see his Lenin statue or Stalin statue everywhere in the Soviet Union, same thing, right? Yeah, and Mao considered himself as the orthodox follower of Karl Marx, right? So you have this, uh, this, uh, this uh, propaganda poster everywhere in China. You will see Karl Marx here uh, as the originator of Marxism. And then you have Engels, uh, Karl Marx's best friend, and then you have Vladimir Lenin, okay? And hello, can you guys hear me? Okay, yeah. We I can hear like, you now. Oh, okay, yeah. I guess I, uh, okay, well, where, where, where do we, where do we lose the connection? You were talking about Mao as a god. Okay, Ma Mao as a god, Ma Mao as a living god. Uh, okay, so we we're, were talking about the cult of Mao's personality. So there's a Mao's statue established in everywhere in China, in every city. And Mao considered himself as the orthodox follower of Karl Marx, right? So you have you, you will see this, this propaganda poster uh, in China everywhere, right? With the Mark Karl Marx there, Engels there, and then Vladimir Lenin and the Joseph Stalin, and then Mao. Okay, so all the what's interesting about this 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 uh, picture is that. In Maoist China, only these communists are recognized as the legitimate communists. Okay. You know, for example, if, if, if you're a socialist or communist in Europe and you disagree with Joseph Stalin, but you still agree with Karl Marx, no, you're, you're not recognized as an orthodox uh, communist. Okay. So this is why in 1952, uh, Joseph Stalin died, okay? Joseph Stalin died in Soviet Union. And then we know that after some power struggle, Khrushchev rose to power in Soviet Union. And then in 1970, uh, 1950, 1956, uh, I'm sorry, 1950, is it 1956 or 1957? 
at the eighth Congress, uh, at the 20th Party Congress of Soviet Union, Khrushchev released a so-called secret report on Stalin to criticize, to criticize or to, to denounce all the crimes that Stalin committed. So Khrushchev actually denounced Stalin at the 20th Party Congress of Soviet Union. When the news arrived in Beijing, Mao was unhappy. Mao did not like what Khrushchev did. Okay, although on one hand, China was still receiving all this technical support, uh, financial support from, from, from Khrushchev, Khrushchev continued the Soviet Union's uh, uh, friendly relationship with China, and he provided, just like Stalin, he provided a lot of uh, uh, financial te technical uh, aids to China. But Mao disagreed with the Khrushchev in his denouncing of Stalin. Okay, so this is the origin of, of China Soviet split. And then later, when Khrushchev was, 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 was removed, and then Brezhnev uh, rose to power, uh, the, the debate between China and a, and a Soviet Union continued. Okay, we're going to talk about the um, we're going to talk about the, uh, the the People's Commune and the Great Leap Forward movement, yeah, to to understand the uh, the split of uh, between China and Soviet Union. All right, so okay, very briefly, I'm going to talk about uh, diplomacy. In 1949, Mao decided that they got to diplomatically, China is going to side with the Soviet Union and all other communist countries, uh, in, including North Korea, including, including Vietnam, including uh, uh, East European communist countries, okay? Um, so China is gonna isolate, is gonna cut off relations with the, the West, okay? Uh, the United States became uh, an enemy uh, later. But in 1949, it was not very clear because the uh, United States still want to maintain a, diplo diploma a normal diplomatic relations with the, with the, with, with the communists. But, the, but, but Mao decided that no, because uh, uh, according, if you want to side with Stalin in, cold, in the Cold War, of course, you cannot, it's very hard for you to maintain a friendly relationship with the United States at the same time, right? So, so Mao decided that no, they're going to cut off uh, relations with the United States. Eventually, um, eventually uh, Beijing kicked out the U.S. embassy uh, from, 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 from Nanjing, uh, from Nanjing. And then in, 19, in 1950, uh, the Korean War broke out. We know that the Korean War broke out because of Kim Il-sung, the North Korean communist leader decided that he's gonna unify uh, Korea. So situation in Korea, very simply, okay, very quickly, we're gonna mention this, is that uh, be before and during World War II, uh, Korea was a Japanese uh, colony. Remember China lost Korea in 1895, after the first Sino-Japanese War, at the same time when China lost to Taiwan, right? Yeah, but of course, Korea, Korea is a little bit is different from Taiwan because uh, the 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 Korean king ruled 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 Korea. Okay, the Chinese only had an indirect sort of influence on on Korea. But but after the first Sino-Japanese War, uh, Korea became uh, a Japanese colony, um, and this situation just like Taiwan, uh, Korea maintained as a Japanese colony until 1949, uh, when World War II ended, okay? When World War II ended, uh, according to the agreements between the powers, North Korea is gonna be controlled by Soviet Red Army. Remember Soviets, the Soviets uh, attacked China's Manchuria uh, to defeat the Japanese. Some of the, uh, the Red Army also uh, entered North Korea, okay? And then the Americans controlled South Korea. So that's the agreement between Soviet Union and, and the United States. The Soviet Union chose a North Korean communist guerrilla fighter called Kim Il-sung. During World War II, Kim Il-sung was fighting in Manchuria and sometimes in, in Siberia uh, as sort of a, as a Soviet, a Soviet Union trained and led uh, guerrilla fighter against Japanese. So that's why he was chosen by, uh, by Stalin. So in, 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 in so, so Stalin sent him to uh, using uh, Soviet Union uh, Navy. Uh, Kim Il Sung was transported from Siberia, Siberia to North Korea after the war, and he became the leader of North Korea. At the same time, the uh, United States also chose a Princeton graduate 
is someone trained and educated in the United States to be the president of South Korean, of the Republic of, of Korea. So there are two Korean governments, okay, um, after the war. And then in 1950, uh, Kim Il-sung got support from both Stalin and Mao to sort of a, a launch a, a war to unify his own country. So in June 19, 1950, a Korean War broke out, okay? Uh, and then with, with the Chinese support um, and the Soviet support, Kim Il-sung's North Korean army very quickly took Seoul because you know, they, 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 they attacked South Korea uh, by surprise. And then within several, uh, several weeks, uh, they pushed, you know, Korea is not a big country. So very quickly, the North Korean army pushed uh, the South Korean army and the American uh, army to this uh, very small area called a Pusan, a Pusan city in South, uh, South Korea Peninsula. Yeah. And then in September, 1950, um, General Douglas MacArthur launched a landing in Incheon, a place near Seoul. So this landing was successful. It cut off the supply line of a North Korean army to the south. So within, within weeks, the North Korean army collapsed. And then from Incheon, from Incheon uh, MacArthur was uh, leading his uh, American troops. In this case, the American, troop, the American army was authorized by the United Nations. The United Nations was the uh, international organization um, uh, that uh, emerged after World War II. So with the authorization of the UN, uh, the, uh, the American troops uh, are pushing northwards, okay? By October and, 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 and November, uh, MacArthur has crossed the, the so-called 38th parallel, which is the, um, the 38th parallel is the, the divide uh, between Soviet occupied area and American occupied area. In, in the peninsula. So, so when MacArthur was winning, so he crossed the 30th parallel and he pushed all the way to the Korean-China border. And this, this is considered as a threat by Mao, okay? So in, 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 in October and November, Mao uh, sent more than 200,000 Chinese uh, PRC soldiers and they, they, they arrived Korea in the name of volunteers, but they're not actually not volunteers. They are, they're just sent by their state. So they ambushed in the winter of 1950, the Chinese communist army ambushed MacArthur in North Korea. So when, when the Americans got ambushed, of course, they, they did not know how many, how many enemies are coming. So they decided that they got to retreat. So yeah, uh, so they, the Americans got to push the back all the way down to 38th parallel. And then the Chinese communists, they, run, they were running down with the Soviet uh, firearms and the military support, uh, they, they took Seoul. And then when, 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 uh, when the American um, military force realized that the Chinese had a, diff had a serious problem with the, with the logistics and the supplies, they, they launched several campaigns to push back the Chinese. So, and then eventually after three years of fighting, uh, the the situation became stalemated. It's a tie, okay? Uh, so in 1953, when the war finally, uh, when, 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 the, when the armistice was finally signed by both sides, uh, you have this line around the 38th parallel, cutting off the peninsula, okay? So this is why there are two Korean governments today, okay? Yeah, because, well, because of China's military intervention and the, and the United States. So you think about that. But the people, the Korean people, they really have a very sad history of think during the war. Because, uh, you know, when World War II was, when World War II ended, a lot of Koreans thought, you know, finally they're going to enjoy independence. They're going to enjoy peace and prosperity. But those things did not come, okay? In 1950, the war broke out. And look at the, look at the city of Seoul. When Kim Il-sung launched the war, Seoul was taken by North Koreans first time. It changed hand the first time, okay? When the communists came, they had a purge, they had, they had a massacre, they killed anyone they did not like, okay? And then when MacArthur landed in Incheon, the Americans and the South, Amer South Koreans took the city of Seoul again, second time, they changed the hand. And then there's a massacre. Because the South Koreans, they got to kill a lot of, North, a lot of people in sympathy uh, to North Korean communist government, right? So there's a, there's a killing on both sides. 
And then when Chinese intervened in the war, the Chinese attacked and it took Salu in, in 1951. So Salu, the city, changed hands for the third time. And then in several months, the Americans pushed back and they took Salu again, but the city changed hand for the fourth time. And every time when the city changed hand, there is a massacre. Think about how terrible things are. So the Korean people really had a very poignant history, very sad history in this war, right? In this war, there is the Soviets, there are Chinese, there are Americans, there are many other, there are, there, are, there are troops from many other countries authorized by the UN, but the people who suffer the most are Koreans themselves. Think about that, right? The terrible, terrible, terrible war. Um, and today we know that North Korean government is still there. And, and, and the, the, the political power is, is inherited within the Kim family. It's a family run. It's a, you know, even, even, even compared to other communist states, North Korea is an exception. Because almost all other communist countries, you don't see this uh, power is handed down to your own son, right? This, this is not communism. This is imperialism, right? This is like a, a traditional kingdom or empire. So how come you do this in a communist country? So very difficult. Uh, to, to justify this kind of a political practice, right? Yeah, pictures of Incheon landing. This is a GIs, American GIs landed in Incheon. And then on the other hand, uh, the Chinese are crossing the Yalu River, crossing the, uh, the China-Korean uh, border, they're entering Korea. And then, yeah, if you go to Washington DC, you will see this uh, Korean War Memorial. It shows the retreat from North Korea uh, when they were probably ambushed by by the Chinese, yeah. So the war lasted for for three years, and the American uh, 50, 50, American lives were lost, and uh, close to one million Chinese lives were lost. So it's a terrible, terrible war, and this is a war that both sides wanted to forget about uh, until recently. You know, when Xi Jinping rose to power since ten years ago, Xi Jinping is in, is encouraged this uh, this anti-American sentiment in China. So Korean War is picked up is used by, by the state uh, propaganda system uh, to sort of uh, to show the, the, the co Chinese communist determination to resist or to, 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 to fight against uh, Americans. Okay, Great Leap Forward. Great Leap Forward in 1957, this marked Mao's new policy to industrialize China. To industrialize China. Uh, how about we have a, a break? Can, can we have a break, maybe? And then we will come back to uh, to discuss uh, the Great Leap Forward. Okay. Turn on recording. All right. Let's resume our discussion. <clears throat> uh, so in 1970, I'm sorry, 1957, Mao launched a series of movements. Uh, most important of them is the People's Commune and the Great Leap Forward, right? People's Commune, we mentioned this uh, uh, before. That means that everyone in the countryside is organized into this commune. Uh, their personal properties are all taken away. And uh, every day they're going to come out to the field to work for the state. Uh, and then they paid a very meager salary, very, very meager salary uh, by the People's Commune. So they basically become slaves of the state farms, of the state farms. Um, and then close to 90% of their product, products were taken away uh, by the state. Great Leap Forward. Great Leap Forward is a movement when Mao tried to sort of uh, boost agricultural production. It did not work out. Instead, it, it, create, it created a, a lot of, a, it encouraged a lot of a local party bosses to lie about their agricultural products. Because Mao basically sending out this message to all the local party bosses saying, whoever can boost uh, agricultural product will be promoted, okay? And it will be praised by me. Yeah, since Mao is considered as this living God, everyone wants to sort of uh, uh, get this uh, uh, praise from Mao. So their local party bosses are lying about their agricultural production. But Mao thought it was, at a certain point, Mao thought it was real. And then Mao was uh, Mao was seriously worrying that what we what, what are we gonna do with all this food since we are having all this rice okay so he was seriously considering this yeah and um, 
it, this is from a local report, a local newspaper. Local newspaper report that for like a one fifth acre of land, not very big, one fifth acre of land. Uh, they the local farmers produce close to two, uh, what is that? Uh, five thousand kilograms uh, ki uh, kilograms of rice. That, that's impo That's impossible. That's totally impossible. Scientifically, that's impossible. But this is a published uh, on on the communist newspaper. Guili Forward also encourages local villagers, farmers, to create steel. We know that's impossible. I mean, farmers don't have the kind of a technology uh, to 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 produce steel in their in in their in the countryside. But Mao encouraged them to produce steel so that China's steel production would match would surpass the uh, surpass uh, United Kingdom in 1958. Okay, so Mao encourages them to people to do that, and he mobilized everyone in the country to have. To, to, to produce steel. So people take off their doorknobs, they melted down their bicycles, they, they, they melted down their, their walk, uh, they melted down everything in the backyard furnaces. These are the backyard furnace, furnaces. And then all they get is not steel, but pig iron. Pig iron is iron that totally useless. And in order to have the fuel for those furnaces, the Chinese farmers cut, off, cut down a lot of forests, a lot of trees. This is, is a detrimental to the, to the environment. But environment only is a small effect compared to the famine it brought. So all these movements did not bring anything. Uh, also in people's commune, since they're having communism, uh, a private property is taken away. Everyone at first is allowed to eat in the common dining hall like this for free. Okay, you can eat as much as you want and for free. I mean, for thousands of years, Chinese famines always suffer famine. Uh, Ch Chinese peasants suffer famine uh, periodically, but now they can they can eat as much as they want. Of course, they eat eat all the food. They eat all the the crops. Uh, women, of course, is also encouraged to work in the field, just like a man. The result is a famine that came that came in 1959. In 1959, there's a huge famine. There's a huge famine. Millions of people died of the famine, yeah. Uh, well, let me tell you the, my family story. Uh, my father, uh, when, when the Great Famine happened between 1959 to 1961, he was lucky enough to live in the city because uh, you know if he had lived in the countryside, he probably would have starved to death or something. Um, but food was, was provided to urban centers as, as a priority. So that's the good thing. But still, even for, for, a, for a city boy, he still suffered starvation, not to mention people in, on, on the countryside, on the countryside. And my grandparents had to sell some of their family heirloom uh, in, during the famine in order to uh, exchange for food to supply, uh, to provide with their, uh, their, their children with the, with the food, with the food, yeah. There's a lot of uh, poignant stories about the Great Famine. Uh, how many people died of the famine? We still don't know, but estimates, reasonable estimates range from 20 million to 40 million. So this is the biggest famine that ever happened in human history, yeah. Uh, there's one story uh, told by a famine survivor. He says, you know, at a certain point, there is, there's nothing to eat in the village. So people search for rodents. People dig for insects. P people try to catch birds. People try to catch, you know, cats. You know, anything to to eat them uh, in order to survive. But in the end, they eat everything in in, in the village. You know, everything in the village. Uh, they they and um, and a poor woman is coming to a party, a local party official, because party officials normally you know had more to eat. The woman coming to the party. Uh, official saying she is willing to sell sex for only a handful of watermelon seeds, just a handful of watermelon seeds. And the party official happens to have that. So, so he gave her this handful of watermelon seeds. 
and she was willing to sell, sell sex. But you know what? This uh, party official was a, so he himself is suffering starvation so much that he becomes impotent. Because when you when you suffer starvation that much, you actually you lo you you lose the ability to have sex in that case. So that's how terrible this uh, this whole thing is. Yeah. Um, one party leader called Peng Dehuai, in 1959, he saw all this famine, and he believed that People's Commune is the reason. Uh, of course, People's Commune is is the reason for the famine. Um, the Chinese Communist Party blamed the natural disasters for the famine. They say for that three years, for those three years, we suffered natural disasters, uh, droughts and the floods. But you know what? This is this is not true because you, the records show that there isn't, there wasn't a natural disaster during those three years. So Mao was lying. So Peng Dehuai in 1959 he criticized uh, Mao's. Uh, radical communist policies. He says, maybe we should uh, reverse all these policies, okay? Because uh, all these policies are resulting in disasters in countryside, especially in his home. He, he, he visited his hometown in Hunan and he saw all these people dying uh, for starvation. So Peng Dehuai, uh, this is a picture of Peng Dehuai as the commander of Chinese army in Korea, talking to Kim Il-sung, okay? Uh, so in 1959, Peng Dehuai, the Korean War hero, criticized uh, Mao Zedong uh, for, for the crazy communist policies. Uh, for that reason, uh, Peng Dehuai was purged. He was kicked out from the government. And then he died in prison. He died in prison uh, a couple of years later. Uh, so no one can challenge Mao's, uh, Mao's policies, even though those policies are totally, totally disastrous. So you can imagine that in a totalitarian society when there, where there's no checks and balances, any mistakes or misconception or, 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 or uh, uh, bad policies could lead to huge disasters. So, so the, the leader's mistakes will be magnified by the totalitarian political system resulting in catastrophes, okay? Yeah, and then all right. So let's let's move on a little bit quick. All right. So the famine lasted all the way until 1961, until Mao himself realized that it's probably wrong to do this. So he in, since 1962, um, a guy called Deng Xiaoping and Liu Shaoqi over here. Uh, this is, uh, I'm sorry, this is Liu Xiaoqi, and this is uh, Deng Xiaoping. Uh, Liu, Liu was basically Mao's right-hand man, uh, his right-hand man. Both Liu and Deng realized that maybe they should reverse this uh, communist policy to give peasants a little bit of freedom so that they can decide, they, they, they can be given a small piece of land, and then they can decide what to, what to plant. So, so, so in, in other words, Liu and Deng decided that they're gonna move, remove a little bit the state command uh, economic policies and, and give peasants a little bit of freedom. And that immediately solved the problem, okay? Agricultural production recovered in 1962, thanks to this liberal, uh, these liberal policies. But Mao did not like that. Mao in 1962, for the very first time, had to do a self-criticism. Uh, at, at, a, at, a, at a meeting called the 7,000 people, uh, 7,000 cadre uh, meeting. And Mao was preparing for a counter strike uh, to remove both Liu and Deng. Well, Deng eventually came back and launched economic reform. We're gonna talk about him next time, uh, but here uh, we're just gonna mention him very, very briefly. Okay, Cultural Revolution. So in 1966, Mao launched the last revolution of his life. And in this revolution, Mao smashed, smashed the party and the government he created himself. Because in 1966, when Liu is rising, Mao felt like he's losing power, he's losing control of the party. So as a result, he wanted to get back the, uh, the hold of the government and the party, but he first must smash it. And the political force he tried to, uh, he, he relies on to, for the revolution are not ordinary party members, but instead young men 
Because Mao doesn't trust, Mao doesn't trust the party anymore. Okay, although he created the party, Mao wanted to mobilize the young men and send out a call to the young men directly, so that they could um, rise up from 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 bottom, um, and 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 and, and smash the government that he uh, Mao did not trust. So that's 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 his concern. So there, are, he has multiple purposes for for launching cultural revolution. Power struggle is first. He wanted to remove Liu and them. Second, he that doesn't trust the party and the government anymore. He wanted to mobilize the young men uh, to to rise up and do a new revolution against the uh, the party. A fourth, he wanted to find a, a a new generation of successors. Okay, remember, you know, succession is always a big problem for communist communist states. All right. After the old dictator die, how are you going to find the next dictator? How are you going to find the next uh, next ruler? It's a difficult question, right? Since Mao doesn't trust the party anymore, he wants to find a new generation of successor among uh, young revolutionaries. So he wanted to give them this environment, the environment of a revolution, to find the new successor. So, so, so there are many, there are multiple purposes, multiple purposes. Okay, all right. So in 1966, Mao mobilized young men, especially the college students, okay, college students like you guys. Mao mobilized them to criticize their own uh, university administration in Beijing University. That's where the cultural revolution, cultural revolution broke out. You know, college students are always not happy with the, with the college, right? I mean, parking, cafeteria, right, class registration, all kinds of uh, complaints, right? But now Mao told them that if you don't like your president, your college president, university president, you know what? Storm her office, pull her off, out of her office and beat her up. That's why we do revolution, yeah. Because Mao has this famous saying, he says, 革命不是请客吃饭. Revolution is not a dinner party. Revolution is not dinner party. It's a it's a violence about one class overturning another class. So in Mao's eyes, those party officials that he did not like have already turned into so-called a capitalist uh, class. I mean, this is this is a ridiculous definition, but but he just made that def he just made that charge. So yeah, so college students, if you don't you don't like your 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 professor. Or you don't like your uh, your pre your university president, you you storm their office, pull them out, and beat them up. And then in night in in one month, in the one in the in one month alone, uh, in 1967 uh, and 1968, in in at Beijing University alone in one month, there are more than 100 professors beaten to death during the revolution. During the revolution, and those young men who are mobilized by Mao, they are called the Red Guards, Hongwei the Red Guards of Mao Zedong. That's that's what they call themselves. Okay, that's what they call themselves. So let me tell you a couple of uh, uh, stories. Yeah, this is a typical propaganda poster. High school students, college students are mobilized um, to smash down the old world. Yeah, this uh, the, the the this the words on this poster reads. Smash the old world and create a new one. Okay, yeah. And Mao told the police and the PRC uh, and 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 the uh, and the PLA to hold back. So, so police were told by Mao to hold back when they see revolution on street. Mao says it's normal. Okay, it's normal. That's exactly what we want to see. And uh, if you see people are killing other people. They're just doing a revolution. Police should not intervene. Actually, police chiefs themselves are pulled out from their office and beaten up by, 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 by the Red Guards. So for like two or three years, between 1966 and 1969, there's an anarchy in China. And that's exactly what Mao wants to see. In a letter Mao wrote to his own wife called Jiang Qing, uh, Jiang Qing became a major leader of the Cultural Revolution, Mao's wife. In a letter Mao wrote to his, to his wife, Mao says, only great chaos will lead to great order. 
So he's using this very ironic, strange, dialectical way of thinking. Yeah. So they believe that only great chaos uh, could uh, create a great order. Yeah. So, so for eight times, Mao uh, welcomed regards visiting Beijing. And he had he organized huge parades and a huge meeting with the, with the, in, in, in Tiananmen Square, uh, Tiananmen Square in at the heart of Beijing City. And Mao was waving to to the red guards. One each time Mao waved to more than one million red guards. And my father was one of them. Yeah, my father was one of them. Uh, my, my father told me that. Uh, in, in the year of 1976, uh, 1967, I believe. Yeah, he got this free, this free train ride from Nanjing City to Beijing to join the, the big parade, to join the big parade. And the, uh, uh, the train station was told by Mao to give a free ride to, to, to Red Guards. So, so they're, they're sleeping everywhere in a, in a train car. Yeah, even, even, the, even the baggage rack was was a food of people, was a food of young men. Everyone is going to Beijing. And in Beijing, everyone is waving this uh, little red book of Mao. Did you, just, did you notice that they're waving a, a little book, a booklet, a red book? This is a, called a Mao's Red Book. It's a, it contains the, the, the excerpts of Mao's speeches. Like, like, like a, the, uh, for example, uh, revolution is not a dinner party, right? This is uh, you know, on one of the pages, okay? And you would wave this red book, at, at those uh, rallies, at those big rallies. I, I, I remember my father told me that he was so excited to see Mao personally. Mao was standing there like a god, like a living god, you know, you know emitting radius. And he, he said, I, I was shouting, I was jumping for like hours. In the end, I lost both my shoes. That's what he told me. Yeah, so he, <laughs> so, so in 1969, when the American young man they're, they're, they're being so excited at Woodstock for rock and roll. The Chinese young man in Beijing, they're shouting for long live Chairman Mao. So, so there's, a, there's a global sort of a movement of a young man revolution or, 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 or young, youngsters movement in 1960s. Uh, very interesting, very interesting, yeah. In 1968, we know that the radical young man, they're storming their university president's offices in Columbia University at Harvard University. In China, they're doing similar thing. They're doing similar things, yeah. Um, high school students were given firearms by local military. And Mao told the, the PLA commanders to say, you want to support the revolutionaries, okay? Mao gave a very vague order to uh, the military uh, commanders to support the revolutionaries. And then the next day, some high school students come to the local garrison say, we want firearms, give us firearms, and we want to launch a revolution. So these high school students, they're given AK-47, grenades, all machine guns, all kinds of weapons. And then they come back to their university campus to do revolution. Let me tell you this story from my, uh, from my uh, uh, big uncle. Uh, my uncle, he was older than, than my father. So when Cultural Revolution broke out, he was already in, uh, in college, in college, yeah. And, so, and, and he became a leader of a local Red Guard group. Uh, and then one day, my grandparents found out that my uncle returned back home from his college campus in another city. And he brought two guns with him. And even when he was taking a shower, he stood keep the two guns with him. So, so my, my, my grandparents asked my uncle, well, what are you doing? You know, we sent you to a university to study, but why, why you came back home with the two guns? And you kept the guns with you all day. <laughs> that that uh, my uncle told my grandparents saying, my faction of the Red Guards lost the war in the university campus. So we got kicked out, <laughs> we got kicked out. And I know that the other, the other faction is coming to get me. So I have to keep guns uh, with me, even when I, when I take a shower. Uh, so that's, uh, that's how crazy it is. Um, and I, I remember when I was young, I read a, a, a newsletter published by a, uh, a Red Guard faction in, in a university. I, I, I still clearly remember what the newsletter says. The newsletter says, 
according to, you know, in response to mouse call, we're launching revolution in our university campus. We put out all the anti-revolutionaries we think are anti-revolutionaries. Most of them are professors, okay? We put them into black jail. But on the other day, the other faction come attacking us. They attacked our dormitory, okay? They used the machine guns, grenades to attack our, our, our dormitory. And we defended our dormitory with the landmines and other tools. But they're killing each other. They're killing each other, yeah. So that kind of a college life, okay? You know, in college, you're supposed to be boozing, partying, and dating. But these young Chinese young men, they're killing each other using, using AK-47. Very, very crazy, uh, crazy eras. Um, well, my father, he was, uh, he, 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 got, he got all A's when he was in high school. But unfortunately, when, cultural, when the Cultural Revolution broke out in 1966, he was just about to get into college. Without a, without a cultural revolution, he probably could have got into a college, but, but since the, the cultural revolution has broken out, uh, Mao shut down all, eventually shut down all universities. And Mao sent all the young men uh, in 1968 to countryside yeah, to solve the civil war problem. Because there's a civil war, there's a fighting on the street everywhere. Uh, so Mao immediately, uh, eventually, sent all the young men to the countryside. Um, uh, this is called a Shangshan Xiaxiang, uh, rustification. Uh, so my father, after all the, after two years of a revolution or anarchy uh, in, in, in the city, eventually he, he was sent down to the countryside where there is no, no school, um, no electricity, no running water. They have to uh, build up uh, the house they're living themselves. Uh, and he had to feed the pigs, uh, work in the land all day. Uh, in the in an age when he wanted to study to learn uh, knowledge the most, he was he was sent down to countryside for almost ten years until Mao died. Yeah, only after Mao died, all these millions of young men were allowed to back to come back to the city. So it's a it's a, it's a very very um, um, radical. Uh, policies, uh, traditions. Okay, Mao Mao also ordered the uh, the Red Guards to turn against China to criticize Chinese traditions, and what they did is violence. Okay, so there are several pictures here. Um, the Confucian Temple, biggest Confucian Temple in Confucius' hometown in Qufu City in Shandong Province, was almost demolished by Red Guards. The Red Guards uh, stormed the Confucian Temple, and they put this. They put ink. Uh, they basically vandalized uh, the statue of Confucius, and then they put a sign. This sign on Confucius statue, and the sign reads "Tou Hao Da Hun Dan." Tou Hao Da Hun Dan, number one big asshole. That's what they put. That's what they call uh, Confucius because they want to trash all the traditions, right? And then they also uh, criticize the Buddhism. These Red Guards. They have forced Buddhist monks to come out from their temple, from their monastery, and they were forced to hold up this uh, very insulting sign uh, to, to self-criticize. And the, the sign says, 什么佛经尽放狗屁? It reads, your Buddhist sutra is nothing but dog farts. Yeah, so this is basically a, just an insult of all religions, because all these religions are considered as people's opium, right? That's a, that's a communist understanding. And they're burning down. The Red Guards are just like Hitler's youth. They're burning down books. They're burning down books. They're burning down antiques. They're, they're destroying all these, everything, all the antiques from China's past. For example, this, uh, this uh, big sign, uh, big sign given by, uh, given by uh, Chinese em traditional Chinese emperors to the Confucius temple. It says Wan Shi Shi Biao, exemplary uh, model for teachers for 10,000 generations. This is a high praise that traditional emperor gave to Confucius. All these were burned. Yeah. And they're burning books. You see that they're burning books and antiques during the Cultural Revolution. Yeah, this is called this is called destroying the so-called four odes, the old tradition, old customs, old cultures. All these are. Are, are destroyed. And Liu Shaoqi, 
This is Liu Shaoqi. Um, Mao's number one political rival was struggled by uh, young students, by Red Guards. And, and eventually he died in prison three years later, three years later. So it's a very, uh, very brutal, uh, very brutal revolution, okay, and, and an anarchy. Um, Soviets, Soviet Union leaders already disagreed with the Mao's policies since the Great Leap Forward. You know, when, when all the backyard, the backyard furnaces are set up in countryside, Khrushchev openly said, this is craziness. Yeah, so Khrushchev ridiculed Mao's uh, radical communist policies. So in 19, since early 1960s, Mao fights back. Okay, the Chinese Communist Party is criticizing the Soviet Union Party. The Soviet Union Party is also criticizing Mao. Uh, so during the whole 1960s, um, the diplomatic relations between Soviet Union and China uh, got stopped, uh, interrupted. Um, and then in 1969, uh, the two communist countries even got into a, a military conflict in our northern border. Uh, this is called a Zhen Baodao skirmish uh, in 1969. And during, uh, uh, during the skirmish, uh, Mao basically had uh, the PLA soldiers to ambush uh, a, 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 a company of Soviet Red Army, and they killed all of them, basically. And then the, the Soviets came back. Uh, to bomb to bomb at the Chinese uh, in 1969, um, Brezhnev and his government seriously considered using atomic weapons on Chinese cities. So yeah, we were pretty close to a nuclear war, okay, in 1969. But at that time, the United States came out saying sent, they sent a message to Soviet Union saying if you use a nuclear weapon on China, this will be considered as as, as a provoke on the United States as well. So the United States is, in, is forcing Soviet Union to solve uh, the conflict peacefully. So, so, so Soviet leader, at that moment, the Soviet, Soviet leaders realized that, you know, from Khrushchev's time, there's a hotline, hotline, uh, telephone hotline between Moscow and Beijing, but it hasn't been used for years. But now, uh, since, since this Moscow wanted to solve the, 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 the uh, the crisis peacefully. So they picked up, the Soviet leaders picked up the hotline. So to their surprise, someone, uh, uh, they, they called Beijing uh, through using the hotline. Uh, to their surprise, uh, someone picked up the phone. It's a Chinese uh, <laughs> operator. And the Chinese operator, operator is using a, a Russian saying, you Soviet uh, people have betrayed communism. You are the capitalist rotors. This is a specific term to call uh, those uh, those Soviet who, in Mao's eyes, have deviated from communist tradition. So the um, uh, the operator says, "Your uh, capitalist rotors, you betray the communism. I'm not gonna connect you with uh, our chairman Mao." So he hung up on Soviet leader. <laughs> but eventually, the, this the whole crisis was uh, was solved peacefully. Um, so. Mao purged all his, almost all his rivals, and he got a strong support from the military. This guy called Lin Biao, a, a civil war hero, uh, strongly supported Mao to purge all, everyone Mao did not like. And then when Mao purged everyone he did not like, he did not like Lin Biao either. So in 1971, Mao wanted Lin Biao to do, to do self-criticism, but Lin Biao refused. And then at one night, Lin Biao tried to fly, tried to flee to Soviet Union. And the airplane crashed in, in Mongolia. And Lin Biao and his whole family died there. You know, during the whole Cultural Revolution, Lin Biao was the number two uh, leader uh, of China. So this, uh, this crash of, of Lin Biao really became a blow to the whole idea of the Cultural Revolution, of the whole Cultural Revolution. A lot of people started to, to think, after all this craziness, what did we get? Is this really common? Is this really revolution? You know, chaos, anarchy, violence, killing, poverty, and the economy is also on the brink of collapse. So, so the class, so the death of Lin Biao made many people uh, to really reflect upon the validity of the Cultural Revolution. My father was one of them. I remember uh, I, my father told me that 
when the news of Lin Biao's death reached the countryside uh, where he, 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 he worked, he was, he was reading the so-called, you know, Mao published Lin Biao's son's uh, a, a, a document uh, of his uh, revolt. Uh, uh, Mao believed that Lin Biao's son is preparing for a coup d'etat against himself. And he published this document, okay? In this document, Lin Biao's son criticized the Cultural Revolution saying, this is a craziness. This is not a communist revolution, okay? And uh, Mao, Mao published this document in an attempt to show how evil the Lin family is. But when a lot of the Chinese young men in the countryside, uh, when they are deprived of the right to receive education, to, to, to enjoy modern life, when they, re when they read this, this document that criticizes Mao, a lot of them actually agreed with the Lin Biao's, uh, Lin Biao's son's uh, criticism, okay? So, so Mao actually miscalculated a lot of times during, during the Cultural Revolution. So eventually, after Lin Biao's death, uh, who saved Mao? It was Americans. The only good news in the 1970s for, for Mao is the coming of President Nixon, okay? President Nixon. President Nixon, we, we know, I mean, if you know the, uh, the history of the diplomacy between uh, China and the United States, you know that uh, with the help of uh, the State Secretary, uh, uh, Mr. Kissinger, uh, or Kissinger, uh, Nixon made this new strategic uh, plan to ally with Red China. Because, because the um, Americans in early 1970s, they already heard about, they already know the, 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 the conflict between Soviet Union and China. So to follow the, to follow the idiom that your enemy's enemy may be your friend, Nixon reached out to China, hoping that the two powers may form some kind of a military alliance uh, against their common enemy, in this case, the Soviet Union. So Nixon visited China and, um, and he was welcomed by Mao. He was welcomed by Mao, yeah. Okay, so this is a Kissinger meeting with Mao, yeah. So in, in early 1970s, um, United States and China formed a de facto military alliance. The, U the US satellites uh, monitoring Soviet Union, they're sending all the intelligence to, they're sharing the intelligence with Beijing and the Beijing was also given all these uh, uh, US, American uh, uh, advanced weapons like a Black Hawk uh, helicopter, uh, helicopters, right? This, I mean, through the 1970s and 80s, there's a lot of a military alliance and the communication and the cooperation between United States and China. But neither side want to talk about it. Neither side want to talk about that, right? Because the United States don't want to talk about that because you know, China used red China used to be your your enemy, right? You 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 fought against them during Korean War, but how come you're supporting them now, right? It's kind of a difficult to uh, to validate. On the Chinese side, it's also difficult to explain this new alliance uh, with the United States to uh, China's um, other allies like North Korea and North Vietnam. You know, remember Nixon visited China when the Vietnam War was still going on, right? Okay, we did not have time to talk about talk about Vietnam War, but North Vietnam could have fight against the United States for so many years, for ten years, because it's got a support from both China and Soviet Union. Okay, and once once China got into this alliance with the with the United States, this puts you know the 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 Vietcong, uh, the Vietnamese communists, in a very difficult in a very, very difficult position, right? Um, the same thing is true for North Koreans, right? The North Koreans, some of them thought they got betrayed by Chinese Communist Party when, when China uh, welcomed the Nixon's visit. So this is a very complicated uh, situation. But in Mao's eyes, this is a victory, okay? Because Mao's number one enemy in the 1970s is the Soviet Union. The Soviet Union put more than 1 million troops along the China border. And they were preparing for an attack on Beijing anytime. And Beijing is only, I don't know, uh, like 200 miles, 300 miles from, from Mongolia, uh, where Red Army is. So if, if, a, if a Soviets want to attack China, they could send their tanks to Beijing in like one day or two, or perhaps several hours, it could be. 
So, so Mao's number one military enemy in the 1970s became the Soviet Union. So this made, this pushed Mao to form this military alliance with Americans, okay? Uh, so this, this, is, uh, this is to explain why there's this uh, honeymoon period between China and, the Soviet, uh, China and the United States. Okay, the ending of a, of a cultural revolution. Mao believed that revolution must be conducted every, once every couple of years, maybe once every 10 years or 15 years. This is a new idea he put forward in his later years. This is called, a, this is called the permanent revolution, okay? This is his own, this is his contribution to the whole theory of communism, a permanent revolution. Yeah, people need revolution every like 10 to 15 years. Uh, but there's only one limit to this idea. That is his own life. He's gonna die like everyone, right? So eventually in 1976, he died. He finally died, okay? Well, before he died, there was already some protests, some has some protests that are critic that criticized Mao in a sort of a not not a very open or apparent way. But Mao sensed this sentiment from the population, from the populace, and he did not like that. Yeah, in his in the last two years of his life, he promoted Deng Xiaoping to become the vice premier of the state council because he had got no one to use. He purged almost anyone, everyone in his government. So in 1975, he picked Deng Xiaoping to, uh, to become uh, the, the vice premier. But then he kicked him out from the government when, when, when he forced Deng Xiaoping to praise the Cultural Revolution. But Deng Xiaoping refused. Uh, well, eventually in, in September 1976, Mao died. Mao died. And he... Uh, uh, before, right before he died, he picked up a, a, a guy called Hua Guofeng to become uh, his successor. Uh, and his wife, Jiang Qing, is also in the, in the Politburo. And the radical members, his radical followers in Cultural Revolution, like Zhang Chunqiao, Yao Wenyuan, they're all, or Wang Hongwen, they're all in the, in the Politburo, uh, in the Politburo. So, so Mao died um, not knowing whether his legacy of a cultural, cultural revolution is gonna continue or not. Uh, but after he dies, after he died, the party decided that they're gonna worship Mao's mummy, just like the Soviets did to Vladimir Lenin. You know, remember, you know, when, after Lenin died, uh, his body was mummified and put into a, a, a crystal coffin like this, and it was preserved at the Red Square in Moscow, anyone know, right? Yeah, so Lenin's mummy was there as a sort of a secret site for communists until the collapse of Soviet Union in 1991. Well, Stalin did not have this, uh, have this privilege because Khrushchev did not like him. Uh, Khrushchev denounced Stalin, so Stalin's body was not mummified, but Lenin's body was mummified. So when Mao died in 1976, the Chinese Communist Party wanted to mummify his body. But the problem is they did not have that technology. And the Soviet Union was an enemy of the Chinese Communist Party. So they cannot ask the Soviets for this mummification technology. You know how they got this technology? The Vietnamese followed Lenin's tradition by mummifying Hu Chi Minh's body. And the Vietnamese were friends, right? So the Chinese got this technology from Vietnamese. So they mummified the mouse body and it put him into a crystal coffin. So Mao is lying there like a snow white in a crystal coffin, except there, there is no prince to come to kiss him. Um, but instead, he was, uh, his body was guarded by PLA soldiers. Okay, yeah. And at the heart of Tiananmen Square, a huge Muslim, a huge tomb was built to preserve Mao's mummy, okay? So every day you could uh, get in, every morning, you could get in a line in front of the Muslim and pay respect to Mao's mummy. But the problem is uh, the, you know, Mummification is a pretty complicated technology, okay? 
it, it requires you to do something to the body even before the death, but they didn't do this before Mao died, right? So the mummification was not a very successful. So Mao, as a result, the Mao's body is shrinking. It's shrinking. It's losing every year, is losing either a year or a nose or something, a piece of flesh. So today in Mao's mausoleum in Beijing, you won't see a mouse real body. They put a wax statue there, actually. It's a wax statue, okay? The real real body is, I don't know whether it is, it's probably in the, in the storage or something. Anyway, so if, if you really want to pay respect to Mao, yes, you could go to his Muslim and, uh, and pay respect to his, uh, to his uh, mummy, shrouded by the party's flag. This is the party's flag, okay? All right, back to politics. Within one month after Mao died, Cultural Revolution was ended. So that, what does this mean? Everybody hated that, okay? Nobody was really supporting the Cultural Revolution except for Mao's radical followers, okay? So within one month after Mao died, the radical followers of Mao, including Mao's own wife and his nephew and, uh, and, 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 and the vice president of the party that Mao chose for him for, for as, as a successor, Wang Hongwen, all these people are arrested within one month. So in other words, there is a, there is a coup d'etat launched in the party. Uh, the, the, the senior party members arrested all these radical uh, followers of Mao. Okay, this is Jiang Qing, Mao's wife, and this is the Wang Hongwen, the vice president of the party, and some other members. All these radical, all these supporters of the Cultural Revolution were all in prison, were all in prison. Mao did not leave a legacy for his cultural revolution. Nobody liked that, okay? Um, and then very quickly, uh, Deng was welcomed back to uh, the Politburo. And Deng very quickly uh, rose to become the number one leader of the party. And next time we're gonna talk about how Deng reversed Mao's communist policies and introduced free market and capitalism and opened up China. This is called economic reform. China Deng's economic reform shaped what's called the economic miracle that we see in China for the past for the past 40 years. So Mao did not modernize, Mao did not industrialize China that much. Okay. Mao left us a China that is one of the poorest communist countries, but only Deng changed it to become the number the second largest economic entity in the world. So we're gonna talk about China's economic miracle next time. Um, in 1980s, in the 1980s, when China opened up, uh, when China opened up thanks to Deng's new policies, uh, a BBC reporter was able to visit Beijing, okay? So only after Mao died, you know, foreign reporters were, 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 were able to, to enter China to visit Beijing. Uh, and uh, a BBC reporter noticed that there's a guy who would get in the line to visit Mao's mausoleum every day. So the, the reporter interviewed that guy. The reporter asked, you visit a Mao's mausoleum every day. Do you love him so much that you want to see him every day? Well, that person answered, no. He says, I only, every day, I want to make sure he's dead. Yeah, that's the answer, okay? So this will, answer, this will end up our discussion today.